we just were doctors. We were just taught how to move teeth. We had no business studies, I mean, uh, about running a practice. And all of a sudden, day one, you're thrown in with overhead and managing people and hiring people. It's quite stressful. So I hope in the future that the orthodontic profession, as we go through residency, can provide some more business background. Hello there, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Orthopreneurs Podcast. Today, my guest is 122 years old, 112 years old, if you add his age to mine. <laughs> welcome, Mark Farina. How are you doing, my friend? Doing great. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, so happy to be here with you and uh, our fellow orthodontists here at the podcast. Folks, I, I want to just tell you before today starts that... We often have conversations online about, hey, did you hear about so-and-so? Did you hear how big their practice was? Did you hear what they're doing? And, and it's been said that some of the biggest superstars are people you just don't see on the stage. And I f always firmly believe that. I've met so many great orthodontists who run amazing practices, who are great leaders and great managers, and none more so than the person we're, we're interviewing today in Mark Farina. So Mark, I am really thrilled to have you here. I know you're going to blow some minds when we tell your story. Uh, about what you've done and what you've been through and what you've accomplished. And, and as we get into it, I'm also going to explain a little bit of what we have in common and, and what that's meant to both of us. But let's start here. If you don't mind telling everybody a little bit about, you know, what made you go into ortho? Uh, where do you practice? Where'd you go to school? That basic stuff. And then we'll jump in from there. Well, Glenn, thanks again for having me. Uh, just, uh, I'm just ho so happy to be here, just telling my story. Um, orthodontics was really never really on my radar. I originally wanted to be a DJ. And um, because there was another famous Mark Farina DJ, uh, there just couldn't be two famous Mark Farina DJs in the world. So I decided to be an orthodontist. So uh, that uh, took me to uh, dental school and uh, really enjoyed that part of uh, my ortho experience in dental school, pursued it, went to the University of Pennsylvania where I did my DMD degree. And then later went to uh, New York University for my ortho training. My wife, Lisette, we met in college, and um, she is definitely my better half. Uh, I met your wife also, Glenn, so I know her. She's your better half. Yes, you did. As we know, we're, we're smart men. By far. We have that in common. Married up. So <laughs> definitely married up. And um, the, the one condition, though, was that she did not want to live in cold weather because uh, she was originally from San Juan area. So we decided to go kind of in between and we decided on Tampa, Florida. And uh, Tampa, Florida has been our home for the last 28 years. So we started, um, I started renting space from an oral surgeon because we just didn't have the money to uh, start an orthodontic practice at that time. So I met with a local oral surgeon and he was uh, kind enough to, to let me in and, and sublease some space. Lisette uh, worked as a uh, receptionist. And we called in friends and family to fill our waiting room to make it seem like we were busy. So uh, one patient led to another and, and one led to another. And, and all of a sudden, 28 years later, we've treated over 25,000 smiles in the Tampa Bay area. So it's been a, an, an unbelievable journey. Talking a little bit about your story today, there's so many facets to what we can discuss, and we'll get to it in just a minute. Um, I am proud to call Mark a partner. He is also, like myself, a member of Smile Doctors. When did you affiliate with Smile Doctors? It was last year, uh, June 24th. Uh, so we've just made it past our one year, going on to year two. And it, I have had just an incredible experience uh, with the transition. As you know, that we've been in practice for quite some time. We have an incredible culture. And that really meant a lot to me um, to, to associate and affiliate with somebody and an organization that um, it would be almost flawless. They've done it many times over. They have their systems in place. And quite frankly, if you, you ask my staff today, um, they, they are happy. They've got better benefits. Uh, nothing's changed. If you, you dropped a pin from uh, right into our office from this year to last, it's the same. So we're really excited. Yeah. It's interesting how people out there, particularly the least knowledgeable, and it's understandable, they think that when you partner with any OSO, and you and I can't speak to anybody but Smile Doctors, because that's who we belong to um, and with, but they somehow believe that the moment you sign with a, a, an OSO, that your whole life is going to change, that you, radically all of a sudden patient care diminishes and 
you're being told what to do and how to treat and what to use. And at least for our experiences, I'm here and I know you're here to just tell people, no, that's not the way it works. You know, you, you, you're, as Seinfeld would say, you're the captain of your ship, yes. right? You're, uh, you get to do what you want to do. You have autonomy and you work with what you've been working with. And um, you've been an amazing addition and I'm just proud to call you partner, my friend. Really am. Thank uh, you. Happy to, amazing. Be, happy to be a partner uh, as well with the other docs uh, as well as Smile Doctors. It's been a great journey and look forward to the future. And there's other great OSOs and DSOs out there. We just don't know them. And I always like to tell people, if joining any OSO was like um, a soccer league, a football league, English football, you know, I feel like Smile Doctors is like the Premier League, right? I feel like, you know, there's great teams out there. There's great leagues out there, but they're the only one in ortho in the United States that's recapped or had transactions a couple of times. They're worth billions of dollars. They have over 300 practices. And so anybody out there is interested in learning more, please reach out to me or Mark. We're happy to help you on your journey and give you at least our perspective of what we've been through. And as you hear his story and learn what he's done and how he's done it, I think, you know, I think you'll understand that my being partners with guys like this and gals like this uh, really has enhanced my life. And speaking of that, by the way, uh, we don't talk about it very often, even though we've had a number of guests, but Mark, you are a member of the Orthopreneurs RD group, which means that we get to see a lot of each other at meetings, at uh, online or what have you. Um, I usually don't ask people this, but you're a friend and you're somebody who's been a part of it now for a while. And uh, you, you, considering what you've accomplished, you're so incredibly humble. For anybody out there who doesn't know anything about Orthopreneurs RD, it's a, it's a private mastermind with a geographic exclusivity. So we've got some of the best people. Uh, the people in that group to me are some of my closest orthodontic friends and are some of the greatest clinicians and, and leadership and what have you. And there's some young people in there as well who are just full of vim and vigor, ready to get going and, and add to the conversation. Just in a, in a short period of time, how would you explain it to people out there, uh, what it's done or what it's meant or how it's helped you in some way? Well, when I first met you years ago, um, when we were talking about RD, the, the one thing that impressed me, Glenn, was your, and I still remember this to this day, is that it's great building great practices. However, it's even better building great relationships. And that's what I feel the RD group, it's such a small group, that just incredible power that comes out of that, that uh, my practice has grown through that. And I'm not just thinking clinical skills, it's business skills, all these things coming together, culture. And we're, we're really aligning ourselves with uh, the, be the best clinicians in, in the country. So uh, thank you for, uh, I'm honored and grateful just to be, and humbled to be in the group. And thank you for inviting me in. So I, I, I have to say enough of it. I'm thrilled to have you there. So let's talk about your story now. You lost a provider in your practice. And when I first heard your story, and, and just so everybody out there understands, Mark is a very transparent kind of guy. He's going to share everything with you. But when I first heard your story, I had to call BS. I was like, there's no way. Like, there's no way this is true. But if you want to tell your story a little bit about, and if you're comfortable sharing any numbers, yes. where you were, what happened, and then what happened after that? And so I'll, I'll leave it over to you to, to talk a little bit about it, and then we'll dive a little deeper. So as you know, in the last decade, I mean, there are many changes that have happened in the orthodontic space. Um, if you kind of look at the, the progression of orthodontics, it, let's talk, call it orthodontics 1.0. That was back in the days where you had bag and, and you know, you were bending wires and it was, it was very labor intensive. And then I, I consider orthodontics 2.0, you know, self lading brackets, um, the invention of Invisalign just starting. And now I think what's going on is this orthodontics 3.0, which is just an incredible amount of machine learning. AI technology, where you have um, braces that are custom designed for the patient and aligners that are custom designed for the patient, which is just incredible to me. And uh, I'm just so excited to be part of the profession at, at this time. So um, going from where we are today, I mean, Glenn and I are in our 50s and we were just joking about it. The internet. I'm like 74, you're 40, 48, that's oh. our, or 38, that's our 112. Well, you get to remember for the audience out there, the internet was barely even started back then. Um, Invisalign wasn't even invented. So that just tells you how far the journey has come. So yeah. um, now with, with that, um, we had some challenges also. We, I mean, 
we just were doctors. We were just taught how to move teeth. We had no business um, really uh, studies, I mean, uh, about running a practice. And all of a sudden, day one, you're thrown in with, you know, overhead and managing people and hiring people. Um, it, it's quite stressful. So um, I, I hope in, in the future that the orthodontic profession, as we go through residency, can provide some more business um, background. And I, I think orthopreneurs, Glenn, your, your whole organization, I think, fills that void for us. Thank so you. thank you so much for the amazing forum you put not only online, but offline. And, and again, the Amazing. powerful thing is it's the conversations between lectures, the conversations, um, you know, after the dinners, the, the, the happy hours. So uh, that's what I think is powerful. Um, so again, my journey, um, again, I was a solo practitioner um, pretty much in my entire career up until about 2015. When I decided that I wanted to take on um, an associate. So we hired an associate and it was a five year contract. And at the time we built out, uh, there were two locations at that time. So uh, we were doing probably about $4 million um, at that time solo. And then when we added that uh, provider in 2015, we started building some momentum. And then we started adding the third location, which is our flagship location in uh, Wesley Chapel. It's a little bit north east of downtown Tampa. So we had three different locations. Um, we had one office was 1,700 square feet. So it's, it was a boutique office in South Tampa. If you know anything about South Tampa, it's right on the bay, beautiful homes, um, very high end um, type of people. Um, and then our middle kind of Middle class office was in the Tampa Palms location. And then the Wesley Chapel was a brand new, uh, explosive growth community, just incredible building out of that space. So just tremendous growth in that area. So things were humming along. We, we were just adding uh, staff members and then we were adding, we had our best year ever in 2019. And, um, you know, the problem was the, the the orthodontist is always the clog in in the in the um, in the system. We we sl tend to slow down the whole entire process. So it was late nineteen that we said, "Hey, wouldn't it be great to kind of transform us?" And and we set this up in each consult at every location where I could be in my South Tampa office and I, I would be in the big screen. I would review the records and then. My TC would be at the other location with the, you know, the mom and, and the patient. And it would be just like having a conversation as if I was there. Well, in 2019, the mindset really, it, it really didn't take off. So we were kind of struggling. with it. And then, as you know, in 2020, a funny thing called the pandemic happened. And uh, that really changed. That was like the crucible of, of this development of this virtual, I call it the bolt-on virtual version. We had some software. Um, we actually was we shut down like many of us were for about six to eight weeks. Um, we utilized Zoom at the time to uh, connect with our patients. We did over 700 um, Zoom calls during those, those weeks. So what was great about that is we offloaded a lot of that, uh, of those, those um, appointments, Glenn, so when we came back out of it, we didn't have a backlog. So we actually built in capacity as we came out of this, um, you know, this pandemic. The other thing that was interesting is we started having our patients send in photos and we were able to a working diagnosis of just the photos and give them somewhat of a timeline of how much it would take to, to fix their bite. And, um, and then we'd had a, a TC, a virtual TC talk to them about um, how much it would cost. Well, what we found out in the six weeks that we were shut down, we started over 54 patients, not even coming into the yeah. office. People were ready to put money down. So we said, hmm, this is very interesting. So um, we just kept on developing it 
uh, one step. We, we incorporated um, a new patient uh, virtual TC, a new patient um, a concierge, and we kind of built this whole arm of our practice for virtual care. So come 2020, we came out of it. And then that's when my associate decided to go out on his own, which I totally encouraged. I wasn't wanting to, to sell at any time or retire at any time. I was, I was just in my mid fifties and I, I just wanted to continue practicing orthodontics. So uh, what happened was once that was done, the decision was done, we were down a provider. Now, many of us know that when we lose a key member of our, our team, emotionally, uh, it takes a hit on the team. And um, imagine having a, a, a provider losing you know, that production and collection. So we were able to fast track all of the virtual care and we were able to double um, our you know, income in the next year, year and a half. And that was because- Can you, can you we, share that again, please? Just yeah. in case people miss that. Yeah, so by losing the provider, the associate, after that was we doubled our practice. So at the end of 2022, we were a $13 million practice with one sole provider. Say that 13 million with one sole provider. Yeah. Which is, so, and where were you when you had two providers? We were around, around six, five to six at that time. Right. And there, and I I'm just going to interrupt for a second because I talk about this a lot. So I have an orthodontist today and I call it the Facebook effect who will reach out to me and go, you know, Glenn, I've been thinking about joining an OSO or a DSO. But I don't know if they're interested because I got a really small practice. I go, well, how big is your practice? They go, oh, two and a half million dollars. I go, for the record, that's not a small practice, right? You probably get a million dollars in EBITDA. Um, that's a decent size practice. And OSO DSOs are interested in that. But where in our history has anybody ever said two and a half million is a small practice? Now, I think I'll just give you my opinion and I'd love yours. I believe that to start a practice from scratch, with hard work, good systems, good leadership, good maybe EOS, you know, entrepreneurial operating system, or whatever you want to use, you have a system in place to develop policies and systems, metrics to measure by, accountability, and you really run a practice like a practice. I firmly believe that you can take a practice in almost any region. So anybody out there is listening, please don't tell me you can't do it where you are. You can take a practice from zero to $2 million in probably less than four years, five years, right? Would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think if you're committed to your practice and your craft, I'll give you that extra year and say five years, that if you're committed to your craft, committed to your team, committed to to doing the hard, heavy lifting, you're not running home at 5 p.m. to go spend time with the family, right? You're taking care of your fourth kid or your fifth kid, the one that's going to pay everybody else, that within five years, you could have a practice over $2 million, probably shorter. Now, to get from $2 million to say six or $7 million, right, is a big jump. It takes a lot of energy. I don't think everybody's built for it. I don't think everybody has the wherewithal to do it. But to get to where you were, to where we are, right? When we joined Smile Doctors, we were like six and a half million, I think, for Doug and I. And we'd been doing it for about seven years, six and a half, seven years. And our, our practices, we'd gotten to about six and a half, seven million dollars. I think it takes a jump in energy, effort, synergism, uh, systems, um, infrastructure, what have you. Would you agree with that? That it's a, a very different mindset to get from two to six or seven, right? Correct. Absolutely. Right? Yes. I, I think the old adage, what got you here won't get you there. Like that old book, right? Like Absolutely. you have to reinvent yourself, but you can do it and you can do it without killing yourself as well. Would you agree? I would absolutely agree. In fact, I was more exhausted, Glenn, when I had one practice and I saw 50 patients a day, but I was physically trying to do all the work right. and I still, um, you know, do quite a bit. And, but I've now let go and allowed the people that do it better and also are capable of doing it uh, at a much higher level that it's just incredible how much you can scale. But there's exactly. complexity, as you know, you've, you've been there. As you grow, the complexity also grows with it. So uh, you're absolutely positively correct in you need to have uh, a combination of the culture, as you know, any business, and, and you've talked about this before, and Ben and, and Amanda also have talked about it. Culture is really 
the glue that holds everything together. I mean, if you have to love your culture first before anything, oh. I mean, yeah. you, you, we all agree that, you know, we, we used to say the patient comes first. They don't. It's your team. They don't. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I had a doctor come in my office uh, who was working with us who one day I had to clean it up the next day, but told the team, by the way, guys, always remember the patient comes first. And I got to tell you, the team was visibly shaken. How, we don't come first. And I, I said, next day, guys, I got to tell you, in my life, you guys, my team come first and the patient comes second. Doesn't mean we compromise the patient. It means we lift you up, right? And so the whole EOS concept that I've talked about a great deal of developing culture by, by defining your core values, defining what is it that makes your office run effectively, and then making sure that you hire people who just don't have technical skill and put them in the right seat. But as Gino Wickman, the author of Traction and EOS says, you got to find the right people in the right seat. And that means not hiring people who are available because they don't fit your culture. And so going back to what I was discussing, and again, I talk about this a lot. I've been asked to speak now at a lot of uh, conferences to talk about right people, right seat. And how do we define our core values and how do we use that? As a, as a hiring and, and, and reviewing kind of thing. But you go from two to six, you need to reinvent where you, cause you can't do it by yourself. Like you said, I agree. You, you have to develop systems. You've got to create, uh, leveraging certain scales of, of technology so that you can not have to be everywhere. Cause you can't be everywhere by yourself and make $6 million a year and do it with good ortho. But to get from six to 10, 11, 12, like in RD, in Orthopreneur's RD, there's more than a couple of people, you know, Ben and Amanda, Ben Fishbein, his part is, you know, he's well known for having hit that number. And I think Amanda said in, in, on the, on the uh, podcast she did with me not long ago that I think they got to about 23 or 25 in a year. And that's after seven or eight years in practice, folks. But there's other people in that group who I won't mention by name who are more than $10 million. And, and I'd say all of you, and I, I put you in there, obviously, You've learned how to take what you did from two to six. You learned how to do the same concept of reinvention to take you from six to 10, 11, 12, 13. And oddly enough, every one of you who I've met and spoken to is less stressed the more you make. Now, obviously, the more money you make, it can be nice to lower your stress levels, but you were already making enough where your stress levels weren't high because of money. It's that you suddenly learned how to do what most orthodontists listening right now are not good at, which is to step away and stop micromanaging, implement technologies that support your team and your practice and allow people to be trained effectively and to lead so that you become, and please correct me if I'm wrong, an almost superfluous part of the, of the model where your job, and this is how I do it in my practice now, is I show up every day to support my team, to drive the culture, and to make sure everybody feels really good about what we're doing, and to, to kiss babies, hug moms, and do great ortho. That's my job. My job is not to hire and fire. My job is not to tell that assistant over there that she made some mistakes. My job is not to set up the training programs or to do the reviews. My job is to do those five things that I just mentioned. Do you agree with that or do you do things differently? No, that, that's exactly what we do. And, and we um, subscribe to the EOS system and uh, have accountability. Everyone, uh, we meet weekly. Um, as you know, uh, the system is Your just- leadership team? It's just incredible how much, when you have the right people, Glenn, in the right seats, rowing in the same direction, how you know incredible you can, all these goals can be achieved. So I contribute- uh, that EOS system as much as other systems that we've implemented in that tremendous upscale of growth. So what really uh, took us what was this virtual piece that that we really just kind of stumbled upon. And, and we were just kind of freaking out when, when it came to the pandemic. But we said, how are we going to contact our people? And uh, we just took off on that. And that just became our specialty. Um, we have our, our TC, our virtual TC. Uh, she will start anywhere, probably about um, um, $1.5 million this year. That's a separate virtual kind of, let's call it the virtual office. So that means you no real estate, no build out, no hiring or firing. We're using our existing team and, and leveraging technology. 
where you do not have to build and, and drive to the satellite office. So I think that's where the future of orthodontics is going to be, was leveraging these, these new technologies that are coming upon us and having the systems in place where today I feel like I'm even more connected to my patients with this new technology than it was just three or four years ago. Yeah, I, I agree as well. I mean, at first when we started, and again, full disclosure, I, I, I use dental monitoring in my practice. Um, I think they're a great company. When we started using it, there was a part of me that was like, mm, I'm not going to see my aligner patients as often. Um, I'm not going to see my braces patients as often. They're going to hate it. They're going to complain and moan, and they're not going to get as good a care. And I will say this. Number one, patients love it, right? Hey, folks, newsflash, orth orthodontic patients do not want to see you more often, right? You may think you're so special. They do, but they don't. Um, number two, it really is nice to be able to monitor their, their care on a weekly basis. And I know that that's a big stumbling block for a lot of orthodontists is I don't want to hire somebody to have to monitor my patients in the dashboard. And, and again, I haven't told anybody this. I'm going to share it with you right now, Mark, because it's just you and me. Nobody else is listening, right? I, I started a, a project called Remote Response, which is a company that's going to do a call center kind of approach towards dashboard monitoring. So that um, if doctors out there want to get involved in remote monitoring, but don't want to pay the money they have to pay, don't want to hire somebody, don't want to manage somebody, don't want to worry if somebody leaves them in a lurch, right, who's monitoring the dashboard, we'll do the remote monitoring for them based on semi-customizable preferences so that the quality of care is even better because we can do things that in certain hours that, that you can't. Right. Uh, we can customize responses in a way you can't. And only involve the office when the office has to be involved, when somebody needs to be scheduled or, hey, I lost my third aligner and I got nothing with me. What do I do? Right. You need to come into the office and get seen or have something mailed. And so, so again, the, cor the corollary to this whole thing is that using remote monitoring, my patients actually now talk me into it. Hey, I heard that you do this thing where you can watch us once a week and make sure everything's going good because my son, I do not trust him. I want, I want somebody uh, eyes on him every week. And it's crazy how that theme occurs. Have you seen that as well? You should see the mom's face when we, we bring out, you know, the, the dental monitor and then we say, okay, we're going to stop you from nagging Johnny here. We'll be able to be in touch with him weekly. If Johnny has, you know, questions or if you have questions, we have the app right here and just we're, we're always connected. So, um, uh, it is really powerful. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. Just last, you know, yesterday, it was about four o'clock. Um, I had a 12 year old come into the office. Um, mom brought her in and we, again, we've offloaded about 400 appointments a month. Okay. So retainer checks, we, we see if they just don't want to do that. But this particular one was a retainer. Um, mom is a working mom and, um, she works downtown Tampa, and, and I was in the Wesley Chapel office, which is about 35 minutes away. She, she lives out in this area. So she works downtown. She has to travel 30 minutes to pick up uh, her daughter at camp, picked her up at camp, came down in traffic, sat in our waiting room. And fortunately, people don't wait that long in our waiting room, but checked in at our front desk, sat in the chair, and... We checked the retainer and I took a mouth mirror and I said, everything looks good. And the little girl goes, that's it. I said, that's it. So in my mind, I'm like, our five minute appointment plan, which we think is five minutes, turns out to be a two hour ordeal for this mom. Okay. To get her in to see us. So if I don't, I mean, if any orthodontist out there is hearing us, we are not that big of a deal, okay? They do not want to see us. You're, you're absolutely right. And in fact, when we make their life better, they're going to be telling their friends and their friends and their colleagues. And that's how we've grown. We've grown organically uh, through this process. And one of the things that I've, I've really realized is when the pandemic hit, I think the future orthodontic office is going to be one that's flexible and agile. You're going to have to make very quick decisions 
and changes. And I don't mean just in, in treatment. I just, I mean that in everything. I mean that in hiring. We, we, um, have team members that are dual trained that at certain times, for instance, we'll have a financial that deals with insurance, but in heavy times where there are more new patients, she'll sub in for a, a TC. Cause as we know, the statistics just show us that adults uh, don't show up for their appointment about anywhere from 10 to 15%. Well, if we take the airline philosophy and we overbook a little bit, we're going to maximize our schedule. And that's kind of what we've been doing. We run our operation with two TCs. Uh, each TC uh, last month, each one of them did 100 starts each. And our TC, a virtual TC did 36. So that's wow. uh, around that number uh, that we did last month. So what I'm saying is, it's a mindset. Like I, if you asked me five years ago, could my TC ever see a hundred and start? I would say no. So it, but while, it, it's but while you're on that, con- but, but while you're talking about that, if you don't mind, I just want to grab you while you're talking about sure. that, because right now you're blowing people's minds. Like this is everyday stuff to you. And people are like, huh? How do you get so many virtual starts? What is it? How do people find out about them? How do people get steered into them? The the concept of once they're on a virtual exam with good systems, that I completely get, right? Right. If you have rock solid systems that your TC has been trained on, great verbal skills, nurtured the sales funnel from the beginning all the way through, you should be able to close any case virtually that you could close in person. And anybody who says otherwise, I'll debate you on that one. But before they get to you, how do you get so many people into the funnel for virtual do you do it on purpose? Somebody wants to make an appointment and you offer them, hey, would you like to do this virtually or in person? Or how do they, you know the questions I'm asking. If you don't mind, I'd love to hear more. We always give people choices. We never lock anybody into a certain you know, treatment plan or a way of doing things. So we do offer, hey, we do have this platform. You can uh, send some photos in. The doctor will take a look at it. It's by no means a full diagnosis. But if you want to have a basic understanding of what is going on in your mouth and your smile, that's kind of like the first step. So as they get through the funnel, and I'm going to tell you that the, the critical piece of this is speed, speed to lead. Um, the average attention span, do you know what the average attention span is now? I'm sorry. Did you say something, Mark? I, yes, sorry, I, I wasn't paying attention. Yes. Uh, <laughs> 8.25 seconds. I don't even believe it's that long, but I'll give it to you. I feel as I get older, my attention span and and with all this new technology is also lessened. Um, So uh, imagine. So we live in this world, as you know, in this Amazon, I want it now technology. They want ease. They understand the technology. So we're giving that them an option. So as they come through the funnel, uh, we have our virtual new patient coordinator experience person. Then that diagnosis comes to the doctor. We do a working diagnosis. That information goes back now to the TC. The TC has that and now discusses, hey, Dr. Farina, it's going to be uh, uh, 18 months. He thinks Invisalign may be the, the way to do it or, you know, braces is, we could do that as well. Um, and it's going to be this amount of money. Once that person says, yes, I'd like to move forward, they are scheduled an in-office appointment. We finalize the records. We have iCATs in every office. We have iTero scans, a full working diagnosis. And everything is on iPads. So the doctors see it immediately. We're able to see all the records instantly. So I could be anywhere in the office and I'm just handed an iPad and I can make the diagnosis there. Um, and then I go into the treatment room. Now we've done three to five minute consults. And I have, I've seen it. I've literally talked my patients out of orthodontics, millions and millions of dollars, because I sit there and try to give them an orthodontic education. And I'm there with my hands. And I've used all this fancy technology to move things around. I have found more than three to five minutes. um, That's not my job. My job is not sales. Um, and, and people think sales is a dirty word. It, it's really, they know they need orthodox. 
Okay, they know the cost of Orthodox. They've talked to their friends. They just want to make sure that this is the right office. Are they treated well? Are you going to take care of Johnny? Um, and you can do that in three to five minutes. So I let my TCs who are trained, and believe it or not, no TC can hold their job in our office if they are converting less than 80%. Less than 80%. That's like the minimum. So I was telling Glenn before we got on this podcast, I said, hey, uh, I have two new doctors that I now have on board that just are coming out of school. And what's great about our systems, it's plug and play. They're converting at 82, 83. We had 86% one month. And these are people just right out of school. So imagine if you have an 80, let's just call it an 80% closure rate. And the national average is 65. How much more chicken on the bone did you just leave there? So don't waste your time in marketing. Okay. You're, you're just, you're just losing the, that 10 to 20% right off the bat. And I say the same thing with your phone system. Our phones, our new patient experience people, if they're not answering at a 95% or better, they're not going to be on the phones. Oh, yeah. You'd be fired from my office if, yeah. you, were, if you were answering at 95%. You'd 95, be gone. Yeah, 95 you'd is be gone. bare minimum. So they're, and, they're, and by the way, people, yes. I hope you're tracking your metrics out there. Yes. yes. So um, the metrics, uh, you have to have metrics. You have to track them. You have to have people responsible. And I'm going to tell you, the team loves it. Uh, they like numbers. They like accountability. Yeah. They want to see directions. I, I think it's just an absolute must have if you do want to run an orthodontic business efficient. You're seeing a theme here um, as Mark talks and things that I've said, which is number one, it's the reason I came up with the Orthopreneurs University clinical photography course a couple of years ago. Because in it, I talk about digital co-diagnosis, right? Where your team members or you can use it to really increase your case acceptance. Because here's the deal, folks. We're selling orthodontics. Now, people come to you knowing what you are providing. There's no surprise. People came knowing they needed their teeth straightened for some reason or another. They chose you. They walked into your office. Now, ideally, we should be closing 100% of the cases. I want you to contrast that to your life if you ever practice general dentistry out in the real world where someone came in for a cleaning, that's all they wanted was to get their teeth cleaned, and you saw three amalgams breaking down that all needed to be crowned. And you're about to talk to this person about five or $6,000 worth of dentistry, and they walked in for just a cleaning, and you're going to try to convert them. Think of how much more challenging that is, and what the likelihood is they're going to leave and go, this guy's trying to rip me off. As opposed to nobody comes into an ortho office and go, he tried to talk me into something I don't need. No, they all know they need ortho. They all know you're an orthodontist. If you get fulfillment by wasting people's time talking to them for 20 or 30 minutes, I would tell you to talk to your therapist about that. Because if you go in the room, just like Mark said, and you talk to them for three minutes, four minutes, I mean, let's be honest. You walk in a room. I don't know if your room's any different, Mark, but let's talk about this for a second or two. I walk in the room. My TC already has taken the records. She takes her own photos. She takes her own CBCT. She, she loads them up. She's already talked to the patient about their chief complaint. And the best advice I ever gave my TCs is that they are not to talk dentistry. Their job is to be the amazing server at Chili's or TGIF yep. that just the, the patient loves, that yep. they see them as an advocate, a friend, somebody who's there to have fun with them. And then I walk in the room and the second I break that plane, they look at me and go, oh, Dr. Krieger, welcome. I want to introduce you to our new, our new friend, Mark. Mark, this is Dr. Krieger. I say, I say hi. I sit down and I go, great. I, my TC, I say, so TC, tell me, what have you guys been talking about? And she says, well, they've seen three other doctors. Little Billy here comes referred, whatever, however, whatever. And I look at them and go, great. Let me take a look and see what we got. I go right into the exam. I'm not talking about football. I'm not trying to make them my friend. They don't need that, folks. They don't need to hear how smart you are. We all know you're smart. Just let me take a look at the records and see what's going on. I take a look at the CBCT. I run a full CBCT exam. I then put them in the chair and take a look in their mouth. And legitimately, let's be honest, you can do that in three to five minutes easily. Easy. And then I sit them up and say, you know what? Nothing crazy here. We should easily be able to handle this in about 18 months with Invisalign or braces or whatever my TC told me they're looking at. What kind of questions can I answer for you? No, nothing. It seems pretty straightforward, doc. 
Okay, that's probably 90% of my patients. 10% might have some questions. Phase one is where it really becomes more troublesome than it's worth, but you still help. But is your experience any different than that, Mark? It's pretty much spot on. Just, just And remember, we're going to be seeing them either virtually or in the office. We see them more than a regular general dentist that sees a patient twice a year. We see them you know, at least every six to eight weeks, sometimes 12 weeks, sometimes 16 weeks, but we're always connected. So if you want to build a report, we're going to have 18 months to do that. So exactly. don't feel bad that you're cutting your patient and your parents short. You don't have to do it all in that first visit. So just by the gray hairs that we have, both of us have, I, I think less than me. that we um, have learned the School of Hard Knocks way, where we're talking millions and millions of dollars out of our office. And, and by the way, I want to add to that because as we wrap up, I want to just say, you got 18 months to develop rapport with your patients. But again, I had two experienced doctors in my office the other day shadowing. They just came in for the afternoon to sort of watch and see what was going on. And I said to them both, I said, how long does it take for you? You're experienced. You're not fresh out of school. How long do you need to spend at a chair to make somebody really feel good, to feel loved, to feel like you care? and genuinely you care, how long do you need to be in a chair with them? And the answer is, I don't know, a few minutes, three minutes, five minutes. I said, I want you to watch something because I do this with every single patient. I'm going to show you how someone can feel loved for, cared for, and taken care of in less than 30 seconds with you. And they looked at me kind of incredulously. And I even show this to my, the gal who cuts my hair because it's valuable for her as well. And she couldn't believe me until I showed her. And if you sit down or stand in front of your patient, knee to knee, eye to eye, look them in the eye, really look them in the eye and come from the heart and care, nothing else in the world matters but them at that moment and, and send that through and just look them in the eye and go, so how have you been? How's life? Oh, things are really good, Dr. Krieger. Awesome. And how are the teeth doing? Any problems, any issues, anything you want to talk about? And they go, no, everything's going great. Fantastic. Mind if I take a peek? That's it. Okay, people? I don't get into the weather or I'm, maybe I'm putting my gloves on and we're talking about football or baseball, whatever. Sure. But my patients are always seated up when they're waiting for me. Nobody's ever laying flat like a, a fish. They're always seated up so I can greet them like a human being. I look them in the eye, send them my love and really emote that and let them know they're the only person that matters. And if you give them 30 seconds, they don't need more than that in most cases. Do you agree with that, Mark? Yes, I absolutely agree. I mean, you're going to have some patients that, you know, yeah. they ask a lot of questions. And, and you 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 want to be there for them, but I would say ninety nine percent of the time, yes, it could be done in in thirty seconds. So our office is um it's a it's a busy office, but we also have three different locations with different sizes. So the mindset is, well, you have a big office, then it won't work in my office. Well, it works in a seventeen hundred. It works store. everywhere. It works everywhere. So it works everywhere. Yeah. So the mindset is is I think the most important thing. Culture is the most important in the office. And we're just so excited to to be here with you today, Glenn. And I'm looking forward to speaking at the uh, the entrepreneurs in Orlando and uh, yeah. talking about you know some of the things that we're going to be doing in the future, which you were the impetus of, and that's the Ortho Synergy uh, coaching company that we we're developing. Yeah, it's going to be great. And um, and again, I think I may have talked Mark into an Orthopreneurs University course, so that should be fun. And by the way, if anybody there wants to learn it, more about the meeting, I think I think by the time this this drops, I think it'll be completely closed and we're not letting anybody else in. But in, in the event that it isn't, go to orthopreneurs.com and you can click on Summit and it should take you there. And that's where Orthopreneurs University is. So you can take the online courses and get CE for them and build a better practice. But I'm going to, by the way, the corollary to my story with the two doctors was that I walked away from the chair and both of them looked at me and go, didn't believe it could be done like that. I said, now you do. My hairdresser, same thing. Give somebody 30 seconds of your life, staring them deep in their eyes, like you're sitting across from your betrothed and, and look them square in the eyes with all the love you can muster in your heart and make sure that nothing else matters. And if you do that, that is so much more effective in sending love and kindness and care than five minutes talking about the score of the game the other day. That's filler. You can do that anytime. But if your culture, as Mark said, is a good culture, and if that means that every touch point along the way shows caring, concern, and love, they don't need it from you. Now, if you feel you're, you need to give that to your patients, I would investigate your culture. Because if you feel you're making up for what everybody else is not doing, that's no way to run a practice. And that's one of the big differences between a $2 million practice and a $6 million practice. 
And so I'll ask you one more question, Mark, just on this stuff. Did you think this way when you were in your 30s? Did you think that you could just walk up to a chair for 30 seconds? And, and I, I'll tell you frankly myself, no. It took me till close to 50 years of age for me till I was confident enough in myself to know that I'm going to walk up there and, and give them the love and it's fine. But before that, I felt I needed it for my fulfillment. I felt I needed it for their fulfillment. Were you the same way? Absolutely. I mean, it, coming out of school, you just want to prove to everyone that you're capable of being this doctor. And, and that's why I was exhausted because I felt like I had to do everything and make all the decisions when I was in my 30s. So, uh, you know, it, when you're 30s, you have all kinds of time, but no money. And then you get into your 40s and you have all kinds of money, but you don't have as much time. And then when you get into the 50s like us, well, you know, you wish you had more time because time's running out, so to speak. So we, uh, we'd we love to give back more time because time, once, you, once it's there, it never comes back. So I look yeah. for ways in my practice and hopefully we'll teach other people to do this as well in their practice is to, to get back time so they, they can do and pursue the things that they, they want to do in conjunction with, I believe, the, the greatest profession on earth and that's orthodontics. I agree. Everything you said. And for those out there who may, again, I think this is going to drop after Summit has been closed. So I don't think anybody will be able to get to see you because I think tickets will be closed out. But there is a virtual bundle that people can purchase where they can watch it live or they can watch it later if they want to. And they can go up both attend and watch it later if they want to. So, um, Mark, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for being here today. You're one of those guys who really inspires me a ton. Uh, for everybody out there, he is such a humble human being. Uh, when we meet at Orthopreneurs RD meetings and we're last year in Nashville, I remember in Nashville, yep. he's the guy sitting in the front of the room. He's asking questions. He's sharing everything he knows with everybody. You would never know the kind of practice he runs. You would think this guy just started a new practice and was asking everybody's opinion. You're, you're a model of humility. And I'll, I'll quote Omar Bradley, one of my favorite quotes, five-star general. I think it was America's last five-star general, I think. Could be wrong. You can fact check that. Um, he said, we must navigate by the light of the stars, not by the light of every passing ship. And you, my friend, are one of the stars that helps me navigate my life. You've inspired me tremendously. And I'm just thrilled to have you in Orlando, have you in RD, and have you as a friend. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, feeling is mutual. Thank you for all your support and what you've created through Orthopreneurs and RD and the summits. Uh, it's just uh, fulfilled my just incredible for my practice and my team as well. So looking forward to seeing you in Orlando. It's going to be a blast. We're going to have a good time. We've got several stressors in our life. We've got a great profession, but we've got to deal with overhead. We've got to deal with productivity. We've got to deal with team members that are outside of our control sometimes. And the great news is all of these issues are addressed in depth in this year's curriculum at Orthopreneur Summit. So please go to opsummit2023.com, sign up for the meeting that's almost sold out, that everybody's going to be talking about that you really need to be at to be your best practice with the lowest stress and highest profitability. OPSummit2023.com. Please join me there so that I can take care of you even better than you take care of your patients.